Oh, so hi everybody, this is I'm just introducing, this is a mobile and accessibility. Um, so we have, uh, you're all on Wi-Fi, you know about that, the network, it's Cal Visitor. Is that right? Cal Visitor is the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, what else did I tell you about? Um, there's a survey that you can take at the end. Um, you can let me know more about that at the end, if you like. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. The, the <laughs> The, this is the first time we're volunteering. Yeah, sorry. There's a survey that you're, they're going to email you apparently, so it's really helpful for that camp. So if you can fill that out once you get it, uh, it'd be really helpful. For you. Thank you. And uh, so this is Jen Wild, and I will let you uh, begin. Thank you. Um, so can everyone hear me? I have a very loud voice. Anyone not hear me? And I apologize for sitting down. I'm on crutches at the moment. So uh, it would be a very bad presentation if I stood because I'd be in pain and not taking much notice. Um, so thank you for being here. I actually um, ran this presentation last year as well and I would say that there's probably twice as many people here this year, which is fantastic. Um, mobile, uh, sorry, accessibility is something that's sort of picking up. Now, I just want to say if you want to access the slides and I'll be referring to links and things like that, please go to pz.tt slash mobile dash A11Y. A11Y is uh, the shorthand version of the word accessibility. Um, so that again is pz.tt slash mobile dash A11Y. Um, so I want to start with just an idea of who's in the room. Um, who would classify themselves as a developer? Great. And what about a designer? Okay. What about business development? Or, okay, excellent. Project manager? Okay, great. So, um, I have a, a ulterior motive for asking that. We're actually hiring Accessibility Oz. We've got four roles at the moment. Um, US sales uh, person, uh, content writer, technical tester and personal assistant. So we actively hire people with disabilities. So if you know of anyone um, or you yourself would like to apply, um, have a look at our website. Um, so I want to start with my team. This is my team in Australia. We're probably twice the size now. Um, and I've got a team in the US as well. Um, I hope you understand <coughs> my accent. If you feel like um, I'm going too fast, I'm I do try and slow down my speech. I know that the Australian accent can sometimes be hard to understand. In fact, um, I presented at Michigan State University's Usability Day and someone came up to me and said, oh my God, I loved your presentation. I didn't understand a word you said, but your accent was fantastic. So <laughs> that's not the point of this presentation. So if you can't understand me, please you know, put your hand up and say, slow down. Um, so we started in um, Australia in 2011 and I opened up a US branch in 2015. We have offices in New York and Portland um, as well as Melbourne but we're a distributed team, we've got staff all over the world. Um, so I, as I said I actively hire people with disabilities, 60% of my staff um, have some kind of significant disability that affects their daily life such as things like um, reliance on a speech-to-text program, on-screen magnifier, keyboard only, screen reader, you know, they have epilepsy or migraines, fibromyalgia, dyslexia, PTSD. And so it is important to note that um, a good proportion of the population around the world has um, a major disability that affects their daily life. Um, conservatively, the estimate in the US is about 38 million people, um, but it's, it's probably quite higher than that. The other thing to remember is it's not just about vision impairments. A lot of people, especially when you're building sites or they know a little bit about accessibility, they'll say, oh yes, it's screen reader accessible, um, and screen readers are what people who are blind and vision impaired use. Um, but there's a whole range of other groups of people with disabilities, people with cognitive disabilities, people with physical disabilities, people with hearing disabilities that require some kind of accommodations or accessibility in your website. Um, so uh, if you are talking to people and they say, oh yes, it's accessible, we tested it with a screen reader, then you know that they haven't gone far enough. Um, 
In terms of what we do, this is the uh, this slide and the next slide is the last I will talk about my company. Um, but we do audits, mobile testing, we build websites, we do a lot of work with disability rights organisations, and um, our websites have often won uh, design awards. So we're really big on making sure accessibility doesn't mean boring, um, video accessibility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have four products. Um, if you're interested in any of these, please um, come up and let me know. Ozplayer, which is an accessible video player, and if you're interested in the accessibility of video players. Have a look at the three play media um, video webinar on our website. OzArt, our automated accessibility testing tool. OzWiki, our database of accessibility errors, screenshots, code, and solutions. And as an attendee of one of my presentations, you get free access to OzWiki for three months. So if you would like access, please come up and um, give me your email address. And a11yvoices.com which is a series of blog posts written by people with disabilities about their accessibility experiences. So we're always looking for bloggers. We always pay our bloggers. If you want to write about an accessibility experience that you've had with a website, good or bad, or you know someone who would be interested in doing so, please send them our way. Um, so, mobile. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to start off with is that um, a lot of people think uh, mobile is something that they need to think about after desktop and mobile is uh, usually 38, 35 to 40 percent of people that use your websites do so on a mobile device and that's the same for people with disabilities. Um, don't assume that if there's someone with a disability they're only going to use a desktop. Now for example um, I had a personal assistant for several years and she was blind and she actually did all her work on an iPhone. Because if you think about it, she's blind. She doesn't need to carry around a computer this big with a screen that big. If you know the iPhone was um, powerful enough to actually um, uh, do the things that she needed to do, so why wouldn't she, um, she use a mobile? So there are things that are built specifically into mobile devices, such as native screen readers, talk back on Android, narrator on Windows, so, I don't know, do Windows even make phones anymore? <laughs> um, and voiceover on iOS. And so, now this is important also, is that um, unless you're buying a Mac, you often need to pay for a screen reader, whereas with mobile devices, they come packaged with the mobile device. So once again, um, especially when you're dealing with people from lower socioeconomic um, uh, ranges, which is often people with disabilities, they might only have access to a mobile device. Um, there's also text-to-speech recognition, volume control, visual auditory and vibrational notifications, hacked keyboard, which kind of tells you what you're doing um, vibrationally, and Zoom. There are also system accessibility settings which affect how your mobile apps display, so font size, touch and hold delay, screen rotation, high contrast, assistive touch, mono audio and left and right balance. So one of the things to remember is that there are, there's um, some correlation between mobile accessibility requirements and WCAG 2, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. However, mobile sites and apps are not specifically covered by WCAG 2. So, for example, WCAG 2 requires that everything be keyboard accessible, but it doesn't require that everything be touch accessible or mouse accessible. This is somewhat um, addressed by the second uh, WCAG 2.1, which was released in June this year. However, it still didn't really go fair enough, um, far enough, and that's um, <coughs> mainly because a lot of decisions with uh, WCAG uh, are done by committee. I spent six years uh, with the working group contributing to uh, WCAG 2 and it can be very difficult to get things um, approved. So uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the problems with WCAG 2. You can't assume just because your site is WCAG 2 compliant that it's accessible on a mobile device. There is an excellent set of guidelines called the BBC Mobile Accessibility Guidelines and they are um, generally accepted as the standard that you use if you want to make your mobile stuff accessible. Um, so that's definitely worth looking at and that includes mobile app accessibility as well as mobile site accessibility. Um, so definitely have a look at that. 
Now, also, another thing that um, you might not be aware of is 2014 was uh, an interesting year where, in terms of the amount of time that people spent online, um, 2014 was the year that people spent more time online using a mobile or tablet device than using a desktop. So if you spend, if someone spends six hours a day on um, uh, online, they're spending at least three hours on a mobile or tablet device. So that's really important to be to um, to be aware of, and it's sort of something that you should do when you start building your sites. Is really think about mobile first, um, and that along with things like uh, what kind of devices. Now, of course. I started in operating system and testing, operating system and browser testing back in 96. And uh, back then we had like Windows 95 and Windows something or other and like three browsers that we needed to test on. Now there's something like 14 different thousand, 14,000 different mobile and tablet devices. You can't test on them all. Uh, no one can test on them all. So really look at your Google Analytics or your, whatever your analytics are and see what people are using. In the Western world, if you have a site that's aimed um, at people in the West, it's usually iOS devices with like some Samsung Galaxies and things like that. But it's very different uh, when you talk about Asian countries. So definitely look at your analytics to determine uh, what things that you should test on. Um, the other thing to uh, be aware of is that The amount of time, sorry, I just had a moment where I was like, what is that slide? Um, the amount of time is slowly increasing as well. We're gonna to get to a point where, you know, 70 to 80% of people's time accessing the internet is via a mobile device. And this actually applies to people with disabilities as well. So this is the percentage of screen readers that use a mobile and use a mobile screen reader. Um, so, you know, down from two, January 2009 when it was 12% to um, 2015 when it was about 70%. Now you'll notice that it went down from 82% to 70% and that's because in the um, screen reader survey that was done in 2015, there was a push to um, address, to include a lot of people with low vision who use uh, magnifiers and things like that. So they're not going to use a screen reader. But in terms of the actual number of people that use screen readers on mobile devices, uh, that number is only increasing. And it's probably about, you know, 80% of people that use screen readers will do so on their mobile device. So let's have a, have a um, look at some of the serious mobile accessibility issues. So PDFs, this is what happens when you hit a PDF. Anyone? Let's wait. You know, it's not like I need that information anytime soon. You know, and then you get something that looks like that. It doesn't reflow. Um, you know, it's not friendly to mobile. Whereas, you know, you've got something that uh, like a website, read flows, you can increase the text size, etc., etc. The other thing to remember is that PDFs usually are larger file sizes than websites, and on a mobile device you have a slower connection speed, um, and that means it takes longer to download on mobile, and it increases people's data usage. So that means unhappy customers. And if we're all, you know, you should all be aware that we're all in it to make the customers happy and give them what they need. Um, you don't want to annoy them like that. I, I myself don't really like PDFs, um, and I've, I've got a couple of presentations on PDF accessibility on the website if you're interested. Um, so then there's things like actually building sites specific to mobile. So on the left is the energy, um, energy rating, which is a bit like your energy star in Australia, and that's what it was on the left when we started. And then on the right, that's what we built. So much friendlier. If you think about um, the Energy Star system, you aren't usually doing a whole lot of research, you know, at home on your desktop. You've gone out to a store, you're looking at a series of washing machines, and you're like, actually, I want to see the star rating on that washing machine. You're not going to be pulling up a desktop at that <coughs> point. Um, and so we did work very hard to make these mobile friendly. Um, another issue is autoplay. So autoplay is a massive problem for a whole range of different users. Um, autoplay is when a video plays automatically when you go to a page. Can anyone tell me what, you know, a problem, and I have a prize, 
art for whoever can tell me what the problem would be for having something that auto plays. <coughs> Go. Um, it can create disoriented experiences, particularly with people with various problems. Very good. Come up and see me later. So basically, the answer was it can be very disorienting for people with cognitive disabilities. The audio of a video also will play um, over a user's screen reader, and so therefore the screen reader user isn't going to be able to navigate the site. Um, so that can be problematic. So this is um, Jamie's Oliver, Jamie Oliver's recipes book, a uh, mobile app, and um, when you first uh, when you first open the app it throws you to your standard mobile um, video player and plays a video. And there's no way to, once the video plays, it stops playing, it doesn't take you back to the mobile app. So you can see that, you know, if you couldn't see, that could be very disorienting, you wouldn't know um, what was going on. Um, continuous movement is also a big problem. Um, continuous movement is one of the four non-interference clauses of WCAG 2, and they can be um, very, problematic for people who have, say, ADHD. Um, and it's more of an issue on mobile devices than it is on desktop because it takes up more of the screen real estate. Um, so that's something to be aware of as well. Um, also, on um, uh, carousels and slideshows, we actually created an accessible slideshow um, that you can use with Drupal. Um, if you look up accessible slideshow um, accessibility Oz on GitHub, um, it's available under Creative Commons and you can use it um, as you like. Um, mobile issues. So there are a number of different traps in mobile devices that people haven't really um, encountered uh, on desktop. So the first one is the on-screen keyboard trap. So this is basically where your on-screen keyboard remains popped up. Um, and you can't escape from it. So this is Trello, and anywhere you tap on the screen, um, you can't get rid of the on-screen keyboard. Now this is a problem because it overlaps content, um, but it also really takes up a huge amount of screen real estate. Um, and so, by the way, when I talk about these traps, these are traps that we at Accessibility Oz have experienced and named. Um, we, uh, we're actually releasing a mobile testing methodology um, at the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium in two weeks. So if you're interested in that, which will have step-by-step -step guidance on how to test um, for these things, please uh, let me know or keep an eye on Twitter and we'll be releasing that in two weeks. The other one is the hover trap. Now, just explaining this on a desktop, on a desktop, what would happen is if you uh, move, moved over a particular area, popped up area appears, you move past the area and the popped up area disappears. Now on mobile, you tap on the dress and you get that popped up, hit, um, and popped up pop up, um, but you can't close it in any way. So it, even if you tap elsewhere on the screen or anything like that, uh, it remains popped up. Um, so I call that a hover trap. Um, and that's uh, obviously a problem, you can't access the content um, below. Basically, we call these things traps because they're very similar to what we call a keyboard trap in, um, on desktop, where a keyboard gets trapped in a component, like a video player. Um, and the only way to escape from a keyboard trap or any of these traps is to actually close the browser and start again. Um, then we have a voiceover swipe trap. Now LinkedIn has actually fixed this, but uh, for a long time, about three years, uh, LinkedIn, when you wanted to post a status update on their mobile app, you get to a page where it said, choose whether you want to post to your public or connections, um, and the screen reader user could not select either of those options, could not navigate backwards, could not navigate forwards, so we call that a voiceover swipe trap. Um, and this is uh, one that is fairly new, um, what we are calling a touch trap. Um, so it's, if you see down the bottom here, there's a tiny little grey arrow um, that goes up to the top. And if you tap on that, it takes you back to the top of the screen. But for some reason, it, uh, when you get to the bottom of the screen, it has disabled your ability to uh, move up and down using your fingers, swiping up and down. So the only way to actually move anywhere off that page is to activate that little button. Now, that's problematic because the button doesn't make colour contrast. It's not something that you would expect. Um, there'd be a lot of people that would get to that and go, why can't I do anything and uh, be stuck? 
Um, other things are things like access. Uh, so making sure you use correct inputs. So use HTML5 inputs. There's no point, you know, uh, start creating a div to create a drop down. Just use your standard HTML drop downs um, because this is what happens on, um, you know, on mobile devices. Text size too small. Now this is uh, the Virgin Australia mobile app for when you travel, you know, a 15 hour flight from Melbourne to LA. And uh, I, this is a, a screenshot of the iPhone 7 Plus, and you can't use pinch zoom to increase the text. And this stuff, I could not read it. And I've got 20-20 vision with my glasses. Um, so how does something like that happen? How does someone create something that actually can't be used in a real environment? They never tested, exactly. They, they created it on a desktop, on a massive screen, and they went, oh, it looks brilliant, but they never actually tested it on a device. So it is important that you test with devices. You don't always have to test with devices, but in most cases you do, and don't rely on simulators. You need to test with actual devices. Um, text size settings, so this is for mobile apps. There's an option to allow in um, iOS to increase the text size. And so you can see on the left, that's the smallest text size. And on the right, that's the largest. So you need to ensure that you actually support the system settings so that when you users do increase text size, that your containers increase in text size as well. <coughs> but, you know, even Apple couldn't get it right. They fixed this issue. But this is the actual thing where you choose what size text you want. And it says apps that support dynamic type will adjust to your preferred reading size below and then you increase the text size and it cuts off halfway. They have fixed that, but still. Um, large text. Now, if you're going to ignore system settings, then you need to have an option to allow the user to increase the, the system settings, increase the text size themselves, like an increase or decrease text size button. Um, but you know, if you're going to do something like that, make sure that you actually do provide actual large text. That's not large text, that's medium text. Uh, now they've turned off pinch zoom as well, so that's as large as anyone can get, can get to it. The other is um, something like this, where if you do have an in-app setting to increase the large text, make sure it applies to everything. On the left is the smallest text, and on the right is the largest text, because they increase the text size of the article itself, but not the article title and not the article caption or who it's by. So that's important information. You need to increase everything, not just you know your main content. Um, another issue is colour contrast. Um, so you know a lot of people have difficulty reading grey text on a white background, yet designers seem to love it. And so what is it that you do when you go to the Amazon homepage? What's 99% of the <coughs> you know, what you're likely to do. Search. Search, right? So you want to actually make the search really obvious. Now, this uh, is not unique to Amazon. This is Amazon, eBay, Alibaba. It's all those sites. They have this grey thing at the top, and that's the search. That's what people are going to be using. And um, anecdotally, I uh, sat down next to someone who worked at one of these sites, and they had addressed this issue and made it black instead of grey on a white text background, white background. And they found that their revenue increased significantly. And I was like, yes, because then people could do what they wanted to do. So, you know, it really does matter. It really does make a difference. Um, also, another thing to be aware of is broken functionality. Anyone here unsure about how iOS handles Flash? iOS has never handled Flash, right? Yet here is a mobile site with a catalogue in Flash. Now, as I said, in the Western world, um, the majority of devices are iOS devices. So once again, someone built this and then they never actually tested it. Um, they tested it on a desktop and went, oh yeah, it works great, without realising that you know 80% of the people using mobile devices would get an empty screen. Um, another thing to be aware of is that people will use pinch zoom, so um, you need to ensure that your site works with pinch zoom. And it is really important that you have the ability for users to move between a mobile version of the site and the desktop version of the site 
if you're displaying different content. So if you, you restricted the amount of content that you're displaying on mobile, you need to allow users to switch to the desktop site, which Airbnb does. Um, however, when you click that, it takes you just to the main page and it loses all the information that you put in. So you need to make sure that you retain the user's information. Um, source order is another um, big thing. So this is uh, LastPass and I started flying United because United have joined the 21st century and have Wi-Fi on their international flights, whereas Qantas and Virgin Australia and things don't. Um, so I've logged in to try and get my credit card details and it says no network connectivity detected. I'm like, yes, because I need my credit card details in order to get to the Wi-Fi. Can anyone see what's wrong with that picture? Login offline. Now, this is something that is across the board. People read to the submit button and they don't read after. Now, people with disabilities, they actually can't ever really get to this because they're using a screen reader or a magnifier. They get to the, log the login button, they leave the page. But we don't read below the submit button either. So what um, could be a better way of addressing that? Yeah, so have them up here. Or the error actually say, no network connectivity detected. Would you like to log in offline? Or just log in offline, you know? So, and uh, look, even Apple can't get it right. I must have clicked this button, install now, which is grayed out. Um, I just, because I was like, you know, and it just nothing happened. And at the bottom, gray text on a gray background, which is pretty terrible. This update requires at least 50% battery or to be connected to a power source. So what's a better way of dealing with that? Well, if you do have a gray the button out, you should be able to put a message up that says you don't have Yeah, it. enough, exactly. There's a couple of ways of dealing with this. One is not even have that install now option. Just have text that's readable. Because look, all this is readable. <laughs> but that's fairly, that's really not readable, saying you don't have enough battery power. Or have a button and when you tap it, a pop-up appears that says, hey, you don't have enough battery power, you should do something about that. Um, touch targets, so this is another trap. I call this the zoom of doom. Um, so this is basically, if you um, uh, drag anywhere in the map itself, you drag the map. The only way to drag a page is to slow, you know, small, get that small white area. Um, so be very careful about that. I'm seeing a lot of mobile sites address this properly now um, by saying you can only move the map by using two fingers. So that is um, being addressed. Uh, this is um, uh, a list of stores for one of our grocery um, uh, conglomerates in Australia. They've got about 6,000 stores. And so for some reason on this page, they, um, they did this thing where the touch target activates on touch as opposed to on removal of touch. So by, uh, you know, standard default is that touch targets activate when you remove your finger, not when you put your finger on the screen. Now they've done something so that it activates when you put your finger on the screen. So I went to scroll down, I hit South Australia, and it took me to South Australia. Now these 6,000 stores are listed all on the same page, and there's no back to top button. So a back to top button is really important for long pages on mobile devices because it took me about 24 seconds to scroll back up to the top. Also be aware of spacing. You don't want to have completely opposite tasks space, uh, put right next to each other, like edit and mark complete. There is, there's not as much control over what you actually select on a mobile device, and so the number of times that I've marked something complete when I meant to edit it, you know, is annoying. Now the other thing is there's a clause in WCAG 2 that says if you undertake some kind of transactional um, uh, process that you should be able to undo that. So if this was working and it said mark complete, there should have been some way to undo that, but there wasn't on the mobile device. So if you mark something complete, you'd have to log into the desktop, find it, 
you know, ma uh, make it editable again. So you don't want things that are the exact opposite next to each other. Um, lack of testing. So this is something that we see a lot of. Um, best of YouTube, uh, which is here, uh, because of the way screen readers read content, is read best of YouTube. Um, so once again, pretty. it's basically because it's all capitalised. Um, and you could address that in a number of different ways. So have it as sentence case um, in the code, have it capitalised on screen, etc. Um, this is another thing. So you know you select these uh, games, and it says your search for five six six two six nine five six six two six eight seven two, blah blah. Now the problem with this is that's going to be a screen reader user is going to get to that and think they've gone to some nonsense page, but general public are going to go, I didn't do that. Like, that's not what I did. I did not search. So it makes people feel, you know, unsure of the product, unsure of the website, and whether it's taking you to the things that you want it to take it to. Um, this is a mobile site. Um, so you need to make sure that your images are, like, you know, proper for a mobile site and not squished. Um, and also just be aware of um, how people are using uh, your mobile site. So this is a favourite dress shop of mine and it gives me the location in longitude and latitude. So you can imagine me putting that into an Uber, right? <laughs> like, you know, what am I doing if I'm looking for this shop online? I'm looking for the address, right? Longitude and latitude, not useful. Um, this one, I don't know if you're aware, but that's only half of Australia. That's the half of Australia that no one lives in. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, at least you can scroll across, but once again, be aware of how this is going to be used. <coughs> and this is uh, my social media presentation, which is also online, in one slide. Basically, what happened, this is a couple of years ago now, but all of a sudden, codes started showing up in all the Facebook headings. And it's not that everyone got together and said, you know what, we're going to add code to Facebook headings. Facebook changed something, and all of a sudden, the code that was hidden before was showing up. Now, most of um, the people got onto this within a couple of hours, whereas Crikey, which is kind of like an alternative newspaper um, in Australia, took about two weeks before they figured that out. And so the thing is, Facebook changes about five times a day. So when it comes to the accessibility of social media, you, you can't rely on the social media network to be accessible. Um, you need to make sure you provide that content on your own website in other ways because it's not accessible via these methods. Other things, you know, you need descriptive errors. Like, I mean, I travel a lot for work and I get this error a bit when I'm, you know, er like, what does that mean? Do I not have enough data? Am I not connected to the internet? Was my login details incorrectly? Is the, you know, the hotel I'm staying, you know, blocking Netflix? What does that mean? Um, okay, so some correct implementations. Uh, so this is Twitterific. Twitterific is really good. Um, sorry, I just got a weird pop-up. Um, and so you can change the increased text size, but you can also change the colour contrast as well. There are groups of people that like to reduce colour contrast. So people who have dyslexia, for example, they like low colour contrast. Um, and then large text. So this is the Apple messaging app. Um, and so it actually does inherit the system settings pretty well. And this is our website. Um, from you know what you could choose to as large as you can make it, and that's as large as some people are going to want to look at the, the content on your site. Um, and then things like functional zoom, so actually zooming in and getting a proper um, image. Also, functionality is a little bit different on mobile devices. You can do a lot of extra things that you can't do on desktop. So here it has the word tap, and if you tap that, then you get like a menu that comes out and things like that. So you need to, if you do have that functionality, you need to indicate it to the user in some way. They can figure it out, but don't assume that they'll know that if they scroll right, it'll take them to the next article. You need some kind of visual indicator to show that, and that visual indicator needs to have a text alternative for your screen reader users. Um, and so this, what they do is they serve a low quality version of the image in the main site and when you hit those little big arrows 
they um, load the, large, the better, better quality image. So if you worry about bandwidth and things like that, this is one of the ways to deal with it. So you know you don't have to assume that people are going to access um, the larger version unless they request it. Um, this one, I only just caught it, but when you first uh, go to this page, this uh, zooms out and says tap or swipe or something like that. Now that's problematic because it goes away and you can imagine people seeing a smaller area of the screen aren't going to catch it and things like that, but having something like that to indicate more functionality is good. And then this here, this is a good way to indicate that if you swipe to the left, that you get another article or something like that. Um, there are a couple of problems. It's very small, it's using colour alone, um, etc, etc. But it is a way of indicating that there's more functionality. A better way of doing it is something like this, where it's actually cut off on the side of the screen, so the user knows that if they swipe, they'll get more content. Um, and this is great. Um, so you have um, <coughs> your standard um, on-screen keyboard, and you also have the previous and next, which actually take you to the next um, the next fields. You don't want to jump to the next field once someone's filled in their details. So for example, if you have four fields for a credit card number, when they put in the first four numbers, you don't want it to automatically jump to the next um, field. That's very confusing for people with disabilities, but this is a way to uh, make it a bit easier to move between the items. And inputs, I cannot stress this enough. Um, when you're talking about websites, use your HTML5 inputs. If it's, a, if it's a number, use the input tell. If it's an email, use the input email. If it's search, use the input search, because that will change what is showing up here in the keyboard. If you put tell, then the number keyboard will show up. If you put email, then the at symbol will show up. So that's really important and makes it a lot easier for your users to use your site on mobile. Um, and this is uh, use of color and shape. Um, so you can see that you start on the second and you finish on the sixth. So you need to have some kind of text alternative for that as well. But this is, you can imagine if you saw this in black and white, it would um, still make sense. Um, and just uh, something just interesting, one of, one of the things that we talked about in WCAD 2 in the working group were a whole bunch of things that help people with cognitive disabilities. And often these things do affect the design <laughs> of a web page and one of the requirements that we thought was good for people with cognitive disabilities or reading disabilities is having column widths of no more than 80 characters. Now almost all of those requirements are relegated to the highest level of WCAG 2, level AAA, and having a width of no more than 80 characters is one of those things. And one of the reasons that we did that was because we said we can't require that you know people make that much of a change to their website. But the mobile device does that by default. The mobile device is a very thin, you know, it's column width by default. And so be aware that there's going to be a lot of users who prefer to use the mobile device on a desktop. Um, the BBC Mobile Accessibility Guidelines, um, that present link, which I'll show you at the end, will also has a link to that. Um, there's also the accessibility fact sheets, which you can access on our site, which has correct and incorrect code for things like progress meters and things like that. Um, and also OzWiki, if you'd like um, access, you can either just drop me an email, um, DM our Twitter, or uh, come up and give me your card or write down your email address. Um, and uh, once again, to access this sli these slides, it's pz.tt slash mobile dash A11Y. Any questions? So we're doing a site for a pretty big uh, foundation uh, for people with vision impairments. And one of the things that they have kind of a uh, legacy and want to maybe keep, and there's like a big debate about it, is the little uh, change the font size and change the contrast um, additional controls. So not part of the phone, not part of the browser, not part of the desktop experience. And they think it might have a good pedagogical role to play and then, like it might let people know that this is available or if someone isn't visually impaired and, they, and they're like just where they are and they're starting to, to explore learn. this space, they think it might be a nice way to like maybe we even don't do anything but take them to a page where we describe how to deal with these things. 
but then part of me is like, that is not best practices, and now we're like fudging it and adding like another way that isn't the good the good way as we understand it to do it. And I was just wondering if you have an opinion on this. So I'll just repeat the question for the audio. Um, so working for a you know a vision impairment kind of company, um, and they have. Uh, sort of increased text size, change font, or change colour options, and you know, is that really the best way to do it? And the theory behind it is that, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that don't know that they can increase text size just by control plus. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that don't know that they can change the colours of the fonts and things like that. And there is um, something to be said for a button that literally just changes the colours. Um, and it's not great it's you know it's not I suppose the correct way of doing it but if that means the difference between someone being able to use the site and someone not then it's probably um, probably worth it there are products like browse aloud which kind of build in those kind of features um, so that could be another way of looking at it um, but I yeah I mean they I think what would be useful is to <coughs> in and then see how popular they are like, see how often they get activated. Yeah, can you repeat the name of that tool one more time? Browse Aloud. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you were showing that some <coughs> websites seem to respond to the phone setting of larger text. Uh, what exposes that? Is that exposed in CSS with a... No, it's not. It's not the mobile sites. It's the mobile apps. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the mobile sites, um, it's really important with mobile sites that you allow people to pinch zoom. So there are ways that with your mobile site, you can turn off the ability to pinch zoom. You don't ever want to do that. Um, so you know, allowing users to pinch zoom basically gets rid of that issue. Uh, but if they pinch zoom, then it doesn't reflow and you have to scroll. Yeah, right you have to, yeah, exactly, yep. Yeah, it's not great, but it's, yeah, it's still, I mean, Mobile is kind of where the web was in the early 2000s. You know, we're still trying to figure out the best way to do these things. Yeah. Any other questions? How careful do you need to be with JavaScript? Uh, in terms of? Uh, uh, in, um, using it to um, change font sizes. Ah, oh, uh, yes. Change, uh, or just basic, um, just, yeah, basic functionality. Okay, so um, in the uh, late 2000s, early, to, like 2012 maybe, um, screen readers started interpreting JavaScript. So if you've been around accessibility or the web for a while, you may have heard that screen readers don't work with JavaScript. That's no longer the case. So you don't need to make sure your site works with JavaScript disabled unless you have some security nuts that you know turn off JavaScript because they're basically the only people that turn off JavaScript now. Um, the basic things like um, form validation um, and you know menu drop downs and things like that, um, most of those things work just fine with screen readers. Um, and screen readers are what you do need to be aware of keyboard accessibility as well. So um, you need to make sure whatever your JavaScript feature is that it's fully keyboard accessible. Um, it's good to have some underlying HTML, um, you know, like using HTML inputs and things like that. Um, but most of the time JavaScript's just fine. Have a look at the, um, I'm not connected to the internet, but have a look at the accessibility fact sheets um, on our website. Look at the JavaScript one, there's a lot of detail in there. Um, as well as correct and incorrect code. Yep. Any other questions? Great. Well, that um, place that URL again is pz.tt slash mobile dash A11Y. Oh, and uh, thank you very much, and hopefully, I'll see you next year with twice the people. <laughs>